Isaiah 30, we'll start out there. I'm going to do a little review, <clears throat> and then my goal is to talk through a, um, a good amount of Isaiah. Of course, I can't get through everything that, uh, that I'd like to talk through, but I, my, my goal is to help you understand how to read Isaiah and kind of the main points of what to look for as you, as you read uh, through it. But Isaiah starts out, Isaiah's uh, a prophet writing in the time of the mid-700s, same time as Micah, same time as Hosea. He may have known these guys, and he is a court prophet. He is preaching to kings, and he lives during the time period of some, uh, some good kings and some bad kings, okay? Um, and is, is friends with some of the, the good kings, okay? And so he has a, he starts out his um, prophecy with Isaiah chapter 1, and the format of Isaiah, in at least Isaiah 1 and other places in the book, is a covenant lawsuit. Isaiah is acting as God's lawyer. He's suing. He's, he's bringing a lawsuit saying, you are in violation of God's covenant with you. Your law uh, breakers, you need to repent. But God is calling them all the time to repentance and salvation. He says, even come let us reason together, meaning you need to think correctly, and that would lead you to understand that what God says is true and right, you need to change and repent. And God says, even though your sins are as scarlet, they can be white as snow, but they don't listen. And God says, your worship is disgusting to me. You sin, and then you go worship, and your hands are covered basically in blood and you do injustice, and you uh, commit idolatry. In Isaiah chapter 2, there's a vision of uh, God's kingdom, and God, the Mount Zion filling uh, out the earth and being the chief of mountains, and the nations coming to it to see God's kingdom and hear uh, the word of the Lord, and then there's this uh, international peace that's going to take place, and all this stuff. But then... Isaiah talks about, but the current situation doesn't look like that. The current situation is that the earth is full of uh, what? In Isaiah, I want to say it's 2.8. Isaiah 2.8, he says the earth is full of something, or the land is full of something. Yeah, uh, the earth is full of idols. Okay. Now keep that phrase full in your mind for, for the uh, book of Isaiah. Um, you guys remember also, by, by the way, to look back to something for this word full or filled, that Adam and Eve are commanded to subdue the earth and create other image bearers that will fill the earth. So remember, God's goal at the beginning for creation is that people in his image worship him, are in fellowship with him and each other, they take dominion over the creation, extending God's kingdom and rule through them, and then they fill the earth with other image bearers of God so that the knowledge of God is everywhere, okay, is the goal. But when man is corrupted and sin enters the world, the more humans that fill the earth, the more sin and idolatry fills the earth, right? So Isaiah says, Israel, your land is full of idols, okay? But he has this vision of God on the throne in Isaiah chapter 6, where he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, uh, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and uh, the angels fly around him and say, holy, holy, holy. And then they say, uh, they say what? In Isaiah 6, 3, there's another key phrase I don't want us to um, miss, that God's king He's enthroned, he's ruling over the earth, and I believe Isaiah 6 is a vision of God's victory in the future because of what he accomplishes. But it's not just that the temple is full of God's glory. In Isaiah 6, 3, it talks about something else. It says, what is full? In Isaiah 6, 3. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, so now the God's—it's not just the temple that's filled. The earth is filled with God's glory. So, <clears throat> when God accomplishes his his plan, his victory at the end, is that his glory is going to fill the whole earth. It's the whole earth is going to become 
the temple. The problem is, <clears throat> well, you guys saw how the angels react to God, right? They cover their eyes uh, because they don't want to look on God as the Holy One. Uh, and they're not sinners. But what's the issue for human beings as creatures and sinners if the whole earth fills if the whole earth is full of God's holiness and glory, like in that direct, a physical of a way. We would die. We would die. You, you guys understand, you guys remember the tabernacle and the temple. You can't just go in there with God's presence, right? There's in Numbers 14, it talks about God's glory filling the tabernacle in uh, in. First Kings 8, it talks about his glory filling the temple, and, and the priests had to leave. They couldn't be in there with God's glory except on once on the Day of Atonement. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a problem. If God's glory fills the whole earth, we're either going to die or we're going to be pushed off. And Isaiah is part of the vision. He sees himself as being uh, greatly sinful because he, he sees now God's holiness, and so he knows that he's sinful, and he says, I have unclean lips, I'm falling apart, and God has to do something for him that's going to be a part of what's going to uh, make this vision a reality. And he says, uh, he, he burns his lips with a coal, okay? And then he says, your, uh, your sin has been atoned for, you have been forgiven, okay? So remember, Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. So how this vision is going to take place, now we get a hint that... It's going to, uh, how, let me just put it this way. You guys, I think, know the answer to this question, but now we kind of see it illustrated through Isaiah. How do people survive in the environment of God's holiness and glory? What needs to, uh, to take place? Like when we're in God's presence in the future, if you're saved, what took place? Yeah. Can you be purified? Yeah, you need to be purified. You need to be have your sins forgiven. You need to be saved, right, and made uh, made holy and able to dwell in God's uh, God's presence, right. So Isaiah said in Isaiah four and here that this is what's going to happen. How it's going to happen is God's going to forgive our sins, and then how is He going to forgive and, and atone and uh, and pay for our sins? Well, you guys already know this. How does God? What does God do? That that. Uh, he sends Jesus, yeah, who's, that's what uh, Isaiah will talk about, the work of the suffering servant, the Messiah who will die uh, to, uh, to pay for the sins of uh, God's people, right? And that will allow them to be uh, forgiven, saved, and made holy, right? So, uh, so we'll get to that. So Isaiah talks about uh, this in Isaiah 6. Um, so the situation right now does not match the future, but God's going to move the situation to look like this, okay? So in Isaiah 7, he talks about even though God's uh, judgment is going to happen, God is going to send uh, the Messiah, one who will be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, uh, and his name uh, is going to be Emmanuel, or his nickname, Emmanuel, or God with us. He's going to eat curds and honey because he's going to be in exile because of the sin of, of the kings in particular. God's going to... The Messiah is going to be born into exile, but he will overcome it, okay? Um, by the way, uh, I think we only had a couple of us here uh, when we went over Isaiah, so I know a lot of this is, uh, is new ground. Who is seated on the throne? And I'm looking for something a little bit more specific, but it's, a, it's an easy answer. I just think you may not want to say it right away. Who is seated on the throne in Isaiah 6? And I'll give you a hint. Uh, John talks about it in John 12, 38 through 41. John 12, 38 through 41 says that Isaiah saw this person's uh, glory and wrote about him. God? Yes, but let's say Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Now, if I said that to a, an <clears throat> Orthodox religious Jew, that... Isaiah's vision of God on the throne is actually Jesus, they would be super offended. <clears throat> but, and, and, and is John fair for saying that? John says in John 12, 38, that Isaiah looked at God on the throne and saw Jesus' glory. How can John say that? Well, because Isaiah shows 
that in Isaiah 6, he talks about God sitting on the throne and he says he is high and lifted up. Then in Isaiah uh, 52, uh, 52, 15, he talks about God's servant is high and lifted up. And so he said, he connects that, that phrase, everyone else besides God and Isaiah who is high and lifted up, uh, God humbles. But God says, I am high and lifted up, my servant is high and lifted up, and so the one sitting on the throne, who's the, the king, is, is Jesus. Okay? And, uh, and you can also prove that because he's called Emmanuel, which, uh, what does that name uh, mean? Matthew spells that out in Matthew 1.23. What does Emmanuel mean? Savior. No. Yeah. God with us, right? So Matthew's saying, look, we now have God with us in the person of, of Jesus as the Messiah who will save us from our sins. Okay, then in Isaiah 9, it talks about in Isaiah 8, the kingdom is going to collapse into darkness. But in Isaiah 9, it says light will, will come. Okay, and it talks about there's going to be this Davidic son who is going to reign over the kingdom of his father David forever and bring justice. But he's also going to be mighty God. Right, so that's Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 verses we quote around Christmas. In Isaiah 10, it talks about the judgment of Assyria. In Isaiah 11, now we have a picture of what the uh, new creation is going to uh, look like. It talks about the, uh, the different animals who would usually eat or fight each other, laying down together, peace. And it talks about uh, God ruling and the, the Gentiles coming and having rest with the root of Jesse. This is a nickname for, for the Messiah as well. Okay. So Isaiah finishes this with a song of praise okay, in Isaiah 12 for what God is going to do. Now God shows that I'm not only sovereign over Israel. He says, look, Isaiah, to show you that I'm serious, I'm going to tell you about my plan uh, for all the nations. Okay. So he says, I don't only have control here. I have control over everything. And so in Isaiah 13 through 27, he announces that he is in charge of uh, all the nations and, and talks about his judgment that is going to take place um, on all of them. And God is so sovereign that he shows that he's in charge of things that haven't even happened yet in human history. Okay. 700s, what's the big nation right now? that everybody's afraid of in, uh, in Israel and Judah? Assyria. Assyria, yeah. There's this big, scary, powerful nation, Assyria, that they're afraid of. And they should be afraid of them because God does use them to judge them, right? So they're afraid of Assyria. But God says, okay, I'm going to tell you about how I'm in charge of the nations. He says, I'm going to even skip past talking about Assyria. I'm going to talk about the next big nation that Assyria is going to decline, and this next nation is going to come up, and let me talk about how I'm going to judge them. Okay? That would be like God saying, you know, China, United States, Russia. Let me talk about the next big nation that's going to take place, right? A hundred plus years in advance. Right? You can see, like... Um, this is one of the things that's amazing about the Bible is these kind of prophecies where God talks about his plan for, for the world and he just says, okay, look, let's skip past this nation. I'm going to talk about the next one I'm going to use. Nobody even would know what that is yet, right? So uh, the next one he talks about is not Assyria, but, uh, but what nation is God going to also use to, to judge his people? Babylon. Babylon. So he says, look, I'm going to talk about Babylon, and Babylon's going to become kind of a picture of um, all the kingdoms of the world that rise up against God and disobey him, okay? Because uh, in the end, right, in Revelation, what nation do you see God coming and, uh, and judging? I mean, he judges the whole world. He does judge Israel, but he judges Babylon the great, right? So Babylon kind of comes back. Uh, at the end, to represent fighting against God, and Jesus comes and destroys it. Okay, that's what happens in Revelation. So when you hear Babylon, that's what it's talking about in the future. So it, it talks about <clears throat> the kind of near future, but it also talks about kind of the distant future. Introduces or reintroduces a concept uh, that we all know uh, called the Day of uh, the Lord, the Day of Yahweh. 
Uh, it says, so there's a, a near judgment, but there's also a far judgment. And then you guys know what the um, next nation is that uh, defeats Babylon and takes over? Greece. Huh? Oh, Persia. Persia, yep. Let's look at um, Isaiah... Where is it? It's Isaiah 13. Trying to find where it is. I want to say it was 1317, but I'm not seeing it there. Hang on just a second. Because, uh, long story short, Isaiah talks about Persia in Isaiah 13. So he's like two nations ahead. He's like a hundred, he's talking about like 200 years in the future that God is so sovereign. He's already talking about the the next next nation that uh, that God is going uh, that God is going to use in Isaiah uh, thirteen. Um, okay, can somebody read Isaiah uh, thirteen uh, seventeen? Uh, yeah, Patrick. Behold, I am stirring up the med- the Medes against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Okay, so. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but what is being said here is God basically just did this. He says, look, you're afraid of Assyria? Okay. I'm going to talk about the judgment of the next nation, Babylon. And he says, and in case you think that I'm not in charge of Babylon, I'm going to stir up the Medes, which is a short name for the Medes and the Persians, and I'm going to use the, um, the Medes to destroy Babylon, to take over Babylon. Right? So, I mean, God is basically just showing, look, I, I decide when nations rise and fall. So he says, I'm in charge of everything. And uh, so he talks about how he's going to judge these nations, but he also talks about that not only does he have a plan for Israel, but he has a plan for uh, even salvation of these nations. In Isaiah 19... He talks about uh, that God is going to judge, but he's going to save people even from the Egyptians and even from the Assyrians. And he says, I'm going to call them my people and my possession and my treasure, just like I call Israel that. So he says, look, it's not just judgment. There's judgment, but then there's going to be uh, salvation of the nations as well. But he says, the problem is, Israel, you're blind. You don't see it. Um, do you guys know there's a book of prayers that are really great to like read, very encouraging, very biblical, um, written by Puritans uh, that you may have heard uh, read in church? Have is, is anybody heard of this book called Valley of Vision? Okay. Um, it's a great book. It's very uh, good kind of uh, vocabulary for our own prayers and has prayers for all sorts of um good things. So, I mean, it's, it's just uh, it's a great book that kind of gets at the heart of like, what we have sometimes a hard time putting into words. But that phrase, Valley of Vision, comes from Isaiah 22. But in Isaiah 22, Isaiah's point is, Israel, you're like the Valley of Vision, but he's using it sarcastically. He's saying you're blind. You don't get it. You don't see what God uh, is doing. Okay, so he, he goes on and talks about um, the judgment of all these nations. And then he says in Isaiah uh, 24, in case we wondered if God wasn't going to judge, you know, he doesn't mention America. He doesn't mention China. He doesn't mention Russia. Uh, it says, okay, in case this hasn't been comprehensive enough. And now in Isaiah 24, he says, I'm going to judge the whole earth. Okay, listen to Isaiah 24.1. He says, Behold, Yahweh uh, lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. Uh, Verse 3, The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for Yahweh has spoken his word. Okay, so it's it's scary. God's going to judge and it says kind of destroy the earth. But remember, There's the kingdom of God that's going to be on this earth. So Isaiah starts to introduce this idea of a new creation. God's going to restore uh, a creation that is going to be uh, new. And Isaiah 65 talks about a new heavens, new earth. Okay, 
which I take to mean after studying this over some years and thinking through the different alternatives, does that mean something that's totally new or does that mean a renewed creation? I think it means that this earth that we're on is going to be destroyed, but it's going to be made like it's brand, uh, brand new. Uh, because I don't think God's going to just get rid of uh, this creation to replace it. I think he's going to show that what he, uh, his salvation and judgment took place here and accomplished his, his work. Um, Isaiah 24, 23, it talks about God's glory at the end. It says, the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before the elders. So it's saying the sun and the moon, if you think they're uh, bright, you guys ever stare at the sun? You, sh you really shouldn't, uh, but like looking at the moon, it said those are going to like kind of fade out because God's glory is going to be so bright as God reigns after he judges. But it talks about he'll, judge, he'll li uh, reign here on, in Jerusalem, in Zion. So God's going to, uh, to come and reign. Isaiah 25. Isaiah, after he gives his statements of prophecy, he gives songs of praise to God. Okay? Isaiah 25 and 26 are some of these great um, psalms, basically from Isaiah, about trusting in God for what he's going to, uh, to do and accomplish. So if you want to read something from Isaiah, there's, I mean, it's all good, right? But something that would encourage you uh, today of kind of trusting in the Lord, knowing Isaiah's circumstances, read Isaiah 25 and Isaiah 26, song of God's protection and a song of uh praise for God's favor, right? And then Isaiah 27 is a song of praise for God uh, delivering Israel. So Isaiah announces prophecy, and then he says, okay, now I'm going to praise God because of that. Okay, so um, here's something kind of cool, something kind of, so that uh, ties in uh, God's work with the Messiah in Isaiah uh, 26, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, but Isaiah 26, 4, it talks about, uh, well, let me start in 26, 3. It says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Verse 4, Trust in Yahweh forever, for Yahweh, uh, uh, Yahweh the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. So remember, Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 26 called God, calls God the rock. But uh, keep that in mind for a few minutes uh, from now, okay? And then Isaiah uh, 26, 19, we see hope of, well, let me back up just for a second here. This is a big point in Hebrews chapter 11, that Hebrews 11 makes the point that Abraham Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, Joseph, Joshua, all these people in the Old Testament, did they live to see God's promises fulfilled? Exactly as God promised them in their fullness, yes or no? No. No. They saw it partially like Abraham had Isaac, but he didn't see all the promises God had made fulfilled. And so Hebrews 11 says that they didn't live to see those things fulfilled. They died, including Isaiah, before what God had promised. Okay? But, the, uh, so why do they trust God, though? If, if they're going to die before the fullness of seeing what God has promised, what are they trusting God for in the future? Okay, and similar to us, I mean, we're, we haven't seen all of God's promises fulfilled. We have Jesus, so that's a big one, but we haven't seen the kingdom of God take place on earth like it describes in the Bible quite yet. Um, so what if we die before it happens? What's the, uh, what needs to basically take place um, so that we can still trust God in spite of that? Yeah. Jesus. It does need to have Jesus, yeah, but, but, but what for us? What for Isaiah? What, you know, is, is my point is, we know the answer to this already, but you come to the end and it's death, well, then you, you didn't get the promises. But, but what happens uh, after death? What's the, what's, what, are you kind of, what are these people and other believers today hoping for? Salvation. Salvation. Resurrection from the dead, right? So Isaiah says, look, even though I'm going to die and not see these promises come true, I'm hoping for resurrection. 
I'm hoping for eternal life, right? So that, uh, that there will be um, a coming back, uh, a resurrection from the dead. Uh, can somebody read Isaiah? This is kind of the bad news in Isaiah 26, 14. Can somebody read Isaiah 26, uh, 14? Uh, yeah, Sophia. They are dead, they will not live. They are shades, they will not arise. To that end, you have visited them with destruction and wiped out all the remembrance of them. Okay, so it says, look, people die, they don't come back. But, um, Abigail, you had your hand up. Could you read Isaiah 26, 19? Mm-hmm. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For you do as a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Okay, so it says there, so like uh, in some, some of the religious leaders during Jesus' day, the Sadducees, they didn't believe that God was going to raise the dead, which you could have gone to a lot of scriptures. Jesus went to Exodus 3. But um, this is one of those texts that says your dead are going to live. So Isaiah says, I'm able to trust God that <clears throat> his promises even overcome death, right? And then we're going to see that as being centered on Jesus because in Isaiah 53, it talks about God crushes this person and he's poured out to death. But then he says he's, now God's going to cause his good pleasure to prosper through his hand. So in between there, there needs to be... Um, resurrection, that the, the Messiah leads the way in, uh, in resurrection. So uh, Hebrews 11 ends and it says, it, Hebrews makes the point like this, it's, it's such a powerful chapter, that it talks about faith is even able to overcome death because faith trusts that God's promises even go beyond death because Jesus came back from the dead. Um, and, and we will be resurrected as well. So Isaiah 26 even talks about uh, your dead will live, your corpses will rise, you who lie in the dust will awake and shout for joy, right? So um, that'll be a big thing in Ezekiel. He says, yeah, you're going to be raised uh, physically, but you also need to have your hearts changed. You need to be raised from the dead spiritually uh, as well. <clears throat> so you can actually see places like Ephesians and Colossians where Paul talks about your dead and sins, you're alive, you're walking around, but your heart is, is dead in sins, uh, but God made you alive uh, through Christ if you're saved. Right? So that's a big theme uh, in Isaiah as, uh, as well. Okay. Now let's talk about Isaiah 28. There's a judgment announced here <clears throat> that's going to take place. Israel's going to go into exile because they're not obeying God. First the northern kingdom, then the southern kingdom. Okay. They're, not, uh, they're not listening. They're scoffing at the word of God, as it says in 28, 14. Okay. Now, uh, we'll do something kind of uh, funny here, kind of humorous here. But let me just um, point out something. So God's not happy with them because they're not listening. And have you ever talked to somebody and you're trying to communicate something? And we're not God, of course. But have you ever communicated something and just, somebody is is just not listening to the point where they're just not getting the point like on purpose. Like they just don't, they're not getting, it's not that you're frustrated that they have lack of just knowledge. They're just like not paying attention to what you said. Okay. That's how God is with, uh, with his people. They're just repeating all this nonsense instead of repenting and coming to God and uh, turning away from their sin. So they, you guys know that like when we have uh, videos and memes and stuff, there are like certain like things we say humorously that we like repeat like little catchphrases, um, like you know, look at all those chickens or you know those. There are, uh, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Or uh, uh, or those things that just like you guys, you guys knew the line right that I was talking about. Um, but you have like little things that people say like uh, this isn't. It's they're taking it from a Bible verse, but it's kind of incorrect. Like people will just say, oh yeah, God will never give you more than you can handle. It's like, well, that's not a really true, but it's something that people say a lot, right? So they're saying this nonsense to God and God is, is going to kind of make fun of them here through Isaiah because look, he says, look, you're going to say a bunch of nonsense to me when I'm trying to tell you to repent. And they're like, yeah, order on order, line on line, statue on statue, one thing at a time. And they're like, God's saying, this is what you sound like me. You sound like a babbling, like, two-year-old, okay, that's not listening. 
And he says, but then when you ask me for help, once you're experiencing the consequences, once you're under judgment, once you're in exile, I'm going to talk back to you like you've been talking to me. Have you ever, um, I, you maybe shouldn't do this, but dealt with like a younger kid or a cousin, sibling, and they're talking to you and they're whining, and have you ever talked back to them in the way that they sound? And you're like, that's what you sound like to me. You know, where they're like, Meh! And you're like, okay, you know, and you do the, the voice back to them, and, you know, they're like, oh, you know, so um, that's what Isaiah and God do here. They're like, look, you're, God's trying to tell you something, and you're not listening. Now, let me uh, point out something else before I get to this, this verse here in Isaiah 28. He says he's going to, because of their sin, he's going to kick them into other nations. Uh, yeah? Can I go to you? Sure, sure. Um, what would be, besides the trauma of seeing people killed and property destroyed and being kidnapped and moved and all that, that trauma is going to happen. But, but once you're living in another nation, what's going to be one of the difficulties of like getting used to and assimilating and kind of figuring out what's going on? Religion. What's that? Religion, Religion yes. Language. Language, yeah, is, uh, is the, the one Isaiah focuses on here. And he says, fine. It, God says, if you're going to babble at me, then I'm going to kick you into the nations. And if you're not going to listen to God in your language, you're going to go listen to all the languages of the nations, and it's going to remind you that God is judging you. Okay, so that's what he says. Um, can somebody read Isaiah 28, uh, 10 and, uh, and 13? Isaiah 28, 10 and 13. Yeah, Abigail. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here is a little, there, there a little. And then 13. Mm-hmm. And the word of the Lord will be to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Right. So he, I know that sounds like just, you know, a repeat, but it is. It's, he's saying, okay, now you're, you're, you guys keep saying this catchphrase, line upon line, statute upon statute, precept upon precept, here a little, here a little, there a little, there a little. And it's, it's just kind of like blowing God off because God's saying something specific to them. They're like, yeah, just a little at a time. And they're like, are you even hearing what God's saying at all? So God says, look, fine, I'm going to say this back to you. But Isaiah is saying, you guys sound like a babbling baby um, in your response to God. And that's what it's supposed to sound like here. Um, Isaiah 28, 10 and 13. Who wants to go ahead and try to read this? I've, I've Englishized the um, the Hebrew. Okay, and it's supposed to sound like babbling. Anybody want to try to read this out loud? Maybe a little far away. Wait, what? It, who wants to try to read this? It's, it's yeah. oh, and if it sounds like babbling or you can't say it quite right, that's not a big deal. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Shisham, uh, shisham. Yeah, that's the bottom part. So, sov laf sav sav la sav kaf. Yeah, so he's he's like, you guys sound like this. Sounds like blah, 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 blah. That's what he's saying. And so he says, fine, when you talk back to God, God's going to be kind of like blah, 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 blah. Like that, back to them. Okay, so he says, maybe you'll listen in, in another language. Okay, so um, so that's what it's supposed to uh, to be. And so they're going to get kicked into the nations and have to listen now to the, the pagan uh, Gentile languages. Okay? Let me give you guys a New Testament connection, <clears throat> two New Testament connections, and a, a hint here on how to understand something here. Acts 2, Jesus has risen from the dead. 40 days he's preaching to his disciples. He goes back into heaven. Then the church is supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after uh, Passover, okay? And the Holy Spirit comes, there's a great wind, okay, which is often the Old Testament uh, sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit. There's tongues of fire that come and descend on the apostles and the disciples. And the, the people who are there in the city for Pentecost hear this noise and come to see what's going on. 
And what are the disciples of Jesus uh, doing? What does the Holy Spirit enable them to do? In Acts 2, birth of the church. Uh, Speaking tongues. Speaking in tongues. They're speaking in languages and dialects. And they're like, this is amazing. This is a sign from God because we're hearing these, these Galileans have this accent, we're uneducated. We're hearing them in our, not only our own language, but our own dialect, right? There are different language kind of uh, centers within different languages. Because you guys know, like, you, you, the Irish speak English, right, like we do, but you guys experience that their English is different. It's a different dialect, right? So it's like Mexican Spanish versus uh, Spanish Spanish, right? So, um, okay. So when they're hearing all these um, men talking in, uh, in tongues, in the languages of the nations, what do you think that shows to them? If they understand Isaiah, Isaiah said, when God talks to you in the other na- languages of the nations, it's, it's a sign of God's judgment. What are they supposed to understand when the disciples are speaking in tongues in Acts 2? What's the sign for them? Is it good or bad? Is it good or bad uh, for the people when they hear the disciples speaking in tongues, knowing Isaiah 28? Bad. Bad. Because it's saying it's, it's a sign of God's judgment. So that's why they respond and they say, what is it God wants us to do? How should we respond to this, this sign? Because... Obviously, something's up because we're in trouble. We're hearing the languages of the nations and knowing from Isaiah that that's a problem. And Peter says, you better believe it because you just crucified your Messiah, God's servant. And now, and he says, but God raised him from the dead and we're witnesses to that. And so now it's a a total worldview shift for them. Okay. Um, First Corinthians also, the Corinthian church is abusing the gift of uh, the gift of tongues uh, it was present at that time. And one of the reasons Paul says they're abusing it, he says, guys, look, it's not just something flashy to do or that the Holy Spirit just gives you for no reason. He says, he quotes Isaiah 28 and says, part of the purpose of tongues is to show the, uh, the Jews that God is working, he's speaking to them in other languages and to convince them to repent because of what God has done in Isaiah. Remind them that they're in exile, that they've rejected Jesus, their Messiah, and get them to repent. So he says, when a bunch of you guys are just blabbering in tongues or speaking in tongues without an interpreter, he says, that's not what tongues is for. Uh, It's for showing a sign of God's power and showing a judgment so that Jews will turn to God um, and be saved. Okay, so that kind of gives us some, I I think, clarity on what uh, the the gift of tongues uh, was and what it was for um, in the Old Testament. I don't know what what your guys' uh, churches uh, teach on that. Um, I I tend to think that tongues is not a gift uh, present for today, um, and that it is languages, that it was used for these specific purposes, but it's not something uh, that you would necessarily expect in your church today. Now, your churches may teach, uh, teach other things, but I think... Um, Some of those things are are clarified by understanding the scriptures this way. Okay, um, we got to quit there. We'll get to uh, some of these other things uh, next time. But that'll do for today.